490 BC, a Greek messenger named Pheidippides ran from the Greek town of Marathon to the capital, Athens, to deliver a message that the Greek army had just beaten back the Persians. Now, the distance between those two towns is 26.2 miles, but that's the origin of the modern sporting event that we call the Marathon. You might know that story. What they don't always tell you is that when he got to Athens after those 26.2 miles, Pheidippides died. So why on earth would anyone want to run one of those for fun? How are our bodies even able to? Well, I decided to find out, so I ran one. And in the process, I discovered a lot about what I'm made of, in more ways than one. You guys ready to run a marathon? My training started millions of years before I ever got to the starting line. The first step to becoming a runner is, well, standing up. And bipedalism is only seen in a handful of animals. Except for a few species of birds, walking on two legs is only used as a temporary form of transportation. Our ancestors first stood up over three million years ago, and well, we were running probably not long after that. We're made for it. You could say that humans are built for long distance running, but the truth is, long distance running built us. Now most four on the floor quadrupeds could easily beat me in a sprint, but humans are metal contenders in nature's distance running events. Even the cheetah, the most perfectly crafted running machine on Earth, can only run for maybe a mile and a half before it overheats. Yet today's fastest Olympic marathoners, they would only be beaten by a handful of Earth's animals in that long distance. One theory of human evolution says that our adaptations for distance running were keys to our hunting success. Like we talked about in my episode, Why Do We Cook? Bigger, richer meals mean that we could evolve, well, bigger, richer brains. There's a whole list of ways that we are made to run. Enlarged tubes in our skulls help us balance while we're running. Reflexes in our eyes keep our heads steady as we move up and down. We have short arms and thin ankles that take us less effort to swing. Wide shoulders, thin waists, and a pretty narrow pelvis help us counter the rotation of our moving legs. We have sweat glands and less body hair and tall, thin bodies that let us disperse more heat. Better blood flow away from the brain to keep it cool. We have big gluteus maximus muscles to stabilize our upper body. We have high surface area, knee, ankle, and hip joints for shock absorption. And most importantly, our lower legs are built like rubber bands. This is by far our coolest running adaptation. Every time my body hits the ground, it delivers up to eight times the force of my body weight. That's over 1,400 pounds. And in order to keep that up for 26.2 miles, my foot expands and spreads like a shock absorber. This is the most important part of a running human, the Achilles tendon. Now, my foot hits the ground, my calf muscle is flexed, but even then, the muscles and the tendons are still a little bit elastic. And then my ankle joint acts as a lever, which transfers as much as 50% of that energy into the next step. By using stored kinetic energy instead of chemical energy, we're able to go farther with less work. You can't run a marathon with just rubber bands, though. You need power. But humans don't run on gasoline. They require ATP. This is an image of a striated muscle, the same type we have in our arms and our legs and basically everywhere that we move. Each one of those stripes contains a string of proteins called actin next to another string of proteins called myosin. Now, the head of that myosin protein, well, it acts like a ratchet pulling along on the string of actin and shortening or contracting the muscle. And that myosin machine is powered by ATP. The thing is, our bodies only have a couple seconds worth of ATP stored up at any moment. So instead, we're constantly replenishing it thanks to our mitochondria and their little ATP factories. Just picture me as a giant ship with trillions of mitochondria at the oars. My body cycled through something like 75 kilograms of ATP during the marathon. That's almost my entire body weight. It just shows you how good our bodies are at recycling energy. Now that 75 kilograms of ATP broken down release the same amount of free energy as a kilogram of TNT. My body gets ATP in a couple of different ways. If I was running full speed the entire time, my cells would be forced to use an inefficient process called glycolysis. But by running slightly slower for the whole race, I let my mitochondria use a much more efficient method called the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. I can burn lots of fuel to make that ATP, like fat or protein, but my muscles prefer glucose, which is stored in long chains called glycogen for quick access. But even they don't keep that much just lying around. 
So instead, I topped off my glycogen tank before the race by doing something called carb loading. Look at all these waffles I have to eat. But even eating all of that before the race, my body can't hold all the glycogen it needs to get through a marathon. So I had to eat and drink more during the race, or else I would hit the dreaded wall. Hitting the wall is just a big, scary name for fatigue, and there's lots of reasons why it can happen. If you run out of glycogen, then your muscles can run out of ATP, and that protein ratchet will get stuck in the locked position. It's actually why something, well, gets kind of stiff when it dies. If your cells don't have enough salt, then your nerves and muscles won't have the sodium, potassium, and calcium that they need to pass electrical signals. The main reason that people hit the wall is because of this. See, your brain is competing with your muscles for blood sugar, and if those levels dip too low, well, you'll feel dizzy and loopy. I think I'm gonna die. Your brain is actually preventing your muscles from firing to go into some sort of emergency power save mode. I've never run a marathon before, and I discovered it's not like any other sporting event I've ever taken part in. You're not battling an opponent, you're only battling yourself. All those feelings of joy and fatigue and pain, well, they only exist in your mind. But that mind is connected to the physical, muscles and chemical power plants and proteins doing work. I've never understood more about my body or my biology than when I pushed them to the limit. And in the process, I discovered that it wasn't a limit after all. Uh. <laughs> That was the most fun I never want to have again. Like halfway through is like the hardest thing I've ever done. And the entire second half was just pure willpower. It's like a competition against yourself. And I, I won. I beat, my, I beat my own mind. That was awesome. Thank you, everybody. We're not the only social animals that sit down to eat together, but we are the only ones who cook. Cultural anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss says that above all, cooking establishes the difference between animals and people, although I think he'd agree that pants make a big difference too. 